Hey, what's up? Welcome to episode 112 of an ongoing series where we basically take the camera anywhere we want and we try to find secrets and new discoveries to some of our favorite games. First off, I want to give a huge thank you to Smash Tunes for doing this week's animated intro. I love his animations. Make sure you check out his channel. He has a lot of content over there with also spectacular animations. Also, this camera was provided by Jasper. Jasper runs a no-clip website where you can explore game maps straight from your web browser. So I'm going to leave links to that also in the video description down below. But here we go, folks. The first mainline Pokemon game on Boundary Break. I know for some of you, it feels like you've been waiting 3,000 years, but the wait is finally over and so with that said let's get started okay we're gonna start off here at the very beginning of the game where sycamore talks to you and I gotta admit, unfortunately, the character seems to just kind of warp around. So there isn't a whole lot that is really exciting here. Except for the mural that he talks about in just a moment is stored off to the left of him at all times. Also, this should probably not come as a surprise to anybody, but when you choose your gender in the game, there is these mirrors that are supposed to reflect yourself. However, if you were to manipulate the camera, you can see that the characters are in fact just standing behind an empty frame. And as for the cutscene when you finally start your game, this is where the Fletchling starts compared to the entire layout of the room. And speaking of the room, the starting house is a very special case. Not every house that you visit in Pokemon Y, it's going to have all the rooms that you can visit visible. However, in your starting home, you can see that both the downstairs and the upstairs are loaded at once. And you might notice that there's a character way off in the distance there. Well, that's your player's avatar, and the reason why that player avatar is there is because that when you're upstairs, there is a mirror that the player can look at that is supposed to have a mimicking image of your character. And that mimicking image never goes away, so even if you're downstairs, your mirror image is going to be at the correct coordinate that would be the opposite of where your character is, leaving you with this void boy here. And before we move on to the next area, let's do a zoom out of the starting area of the game. Next up we have this clip of the area in which you choose your Pokemon. Now it's worth showing this off because this is a very special room used in the game. Once again using a 3D modeled environment, a lot of what is used here are layers. Now you might notice that it's not modeled all the way around, this is because if you wanted to move the camera around in any direction you wanted, having no environment in the way of the camera allows you to pull back and pull forward as far as you want. Now that isn't to say that every environment in this game is 3D, like for example here with Shauna, just before she throws out the Pokemon, you can see that the 3D model is moving around but the environment is not, and that's because this environment is attached to a HUD, making it a 2D texture. But there are a lot of environments used in Pokemon X and Y, and although these aren't official names, I do like to call them biomes, so please excuse my unofficial terminology here, but as you're going to see through this example, I'm going to show you a whole bunch of biomes used in Pokemon X and Y. You'll notice really, really quickly that a lot of these environments don't seem to use a whole lot of 3D objects. And there's a couple reasons for that. One is that it's faster to make. Two is that they can because the camera is so controlled and the resolution is not so hot, so you can hide that detail pretty easily. And three, it also saves up on resources. You may also notice that every single biome is in the shape of a circle or a dome. And the reason for this is that no matter which direction you look at in these biomes, you can see that it'll always look like there's something far off in the distance. It's a very good illusionary technique. And in case you were wondering, this is what the 3D environment looks like when you're evolving a Pokemon. Like mentioned before, it's not a full circle so that you can move the camera at any distance that you want, but what's unique to this area is that it's in the shape of a lens. I also managed to find some stuff outside the boundaries of certain areas. Now this is kind of rare, I didn't see it in most buildings, but in some buildings like this gym here, you can find texture tiles just floating out of bounds. Also within that same gym, there's a character model of the gym leader, and no matter which angle you talk to her at, there's a detail on the back of her head that you can't quite make out. And honestly, I can't say for sure if it was intentional or not. But on the bottom of her head, there seems to be this gray heart shape with a darker gray outline. And just ahead, there was this well here. Now, I wanted to mention this because there are a couple wells in this game, and none of them have this feature to them. Taking the camera below the well, you can see what the bottom of the well would also look like because it's double-sided. And you get this nice looking floral pattern that's not very visible to the player. And you know what, while we're here, let's do a zoom out of this area as well, giving a nice good look at these Lumio City buildings that are not fully modeled, though they are 3D. <laughs> 
first thing to catch everybody up to speed as to what we're talking about here, Missing No is a glitch type Pokemon that first existed in Pokemon Red and Blue. Arguably a short for Missing Number, as that's what its Japanese counterpart is translated to. Missing Number has been very special in the Pokemon community as it's essentially a catchable glitch. Now as we fast forward to October 2013, people saw something very strange in Pokemon X and Y. It seemed to be a silhouette inside of a door frame that looked like Missing No. In fact, this discovery was so convincing and so topical that major video game websites like Kotaku was covering it. And now we're gonna fast forward another couple of years to 2019. Very fortunate to finally have a camera that I can move anywhere I want in Pokemon X and Y, and we're gonna answer this question for you. What is in this door frame? Is it Missing No? Is it something else? Well. We're gonna find out right now. And here's what I think is the funniest thing about this. If you move the camera this way, the answer isn't quite so obvious. It looks like Missing No just completely disappeared. But the truth is, you're looking at him at this very moment. So I suppose we should move the camera in a different way so you can see exactly what I'm talking about. Now, moving the camera through the ground will show you that silhouette is not Missing No, but in fact, another door frame in a different part of Lumio City. And what's happening here is very strange, because after a careful analysis, we can confirm what we're looking at is the game engine's fog. Because as you move closer to the door frame, the Missing No silhouette starts to fade away. And as you pull further back, the intensity of the Missing No silhouette gets stronger. And for whatever reason, this fog effect is bleeding through this doorway, resulting in this sensational image. And since we're already in Lumio City, why don't we talk about it for a little bit? The cab drivers that are sitting around waiting for you to get inside don't have any legs. Now situations like this may or may not happen depending on what game you're playing, but normally if you get this close up to an NPC, they would have legs just in case you could angle the camera in such a way. But instead, the game developers use the darkness to hide those details and avoid having anything below the waist. Which is funny because the holographic projections that you see throughout the game don't have this feature. It almost looks like it should, because that's the effect that you're left with seeing, but that is only an effect. It's something that's hovering in front of the character models. The character models themselves are just ones that are used during trainer battles, but then tinted blue. And so if you move the camera in a certain way, you can see their feet down there, and then at an even better angle, you can see the entire body without that effect that gives it that holographic look. There is one exception though, a news announcer that I never encountered anywhere else in the game. Though I suppose if she did show up somewhere else, you wouldn't be able to see behind the anchor desk, because taking the camera back here shows that she has no legs model. You can almost say it's like she's a floating specter. And since holograms share very similar traits to that of ghosts, let's talk about the ghost girl in one of the buildings in Lumio City. Now if you're expecting to find some answers to some of those rumors and mysteries, you're not going to find them here. The ghost girl, much like every other NPC that walks in and out of a cutscene, just disappears after a certain point. But with the camera here, you can see the exact moment in which she does, which is not something you can normally see within normal gameplay. But I will leave you with something to share with your friends. If you take the camera really close up to the ghost girl's face, first of all, you can see that she's always got a pleasant smile on. But if you take the camera through her bangs, you can also see that she has eyebrows. And those eyebrows are also not very menacing or scary or creepy. It seems like she has a very pleasant face underneath all the creepy stigma she seems to receive. Also, here's a viewer request. As always, you can follow me on Twitter if you ever want to give me a request for a game that I'm currently working on. And this time around, someone asked what it looks like when someone goes inside and outside of a building in Lumio City. Well, they disappear and reappear in the same exact position, but it's not very far off from where that doorway is. And with that, let's do a zoom out of Lumio City. Let's start talking about some other environments, like for example, this super training area. Now this is simplicity at its finest. All the crowds in the bleachers are just different colored squares, and all the banners are indescribable shapes. I do try to fathom the idea of an entire stadium being sold out to a crowd of people just so that Pikachu can throw a soccer ball at a balloon, but I'm not trying to break your immersion here. So instead, let's move on to the Pokemon Center, because inside of here is something that you wouldn't expect to find. If we tilt the camera from the opposite angle in which you normally normally see the Pokemon Center, you'll notice that there's three characters stored here. And those three characters are later used for an event, but are stored inside of this map at all times. And then on the road to Parfum Palace, the camera shifts and has it over the shoulder. With this in mind, however, if you move the camera up, 
you can see that the first few trees don't have any leaves, and that's because once again, at no point could you ever shift the camera in a way that you would be able to see that. And then if you were to have a battle in this area, you can see that underneath the first layer of grass is another layer of grass. And this second layer is completely underneath except for the dead center of it, making almost a donut hole shape. Parfum Palace itself is really massive. To show you one zoom out wouldn't be enough really. So here's the front end of the palace. And then if you were to go to the back end off the balcony, you can see that the whole garden is shown here, but it's just 2D textures to represent the hedges. And although culling is used, you can see most of the real garden without having to be converted into a 2D texture. let's start poking around in character models. This includes Pokemon, by the way, but we'll start with Trevor. See, now we have a lot of character models. There's not a whole lot to look at, but one example here is with Trevor's device that's wrapped around his neck. There are unique textures on the back side of it. These details hardly ever get shown to the player with textures that are unique to the device. All the goons for Team Flare have sunglasses, but what's beyond them is a little bit different than what you might think. See, instead of eyeballs, there's just shadows to represent where the sunglasses would be. And that's not to be said for every single character, the ones that you do get to see their faces every once in a while do have eyeballs underneath as well. The Pokemon don't have a whole lot of interesting stuff, but when you find them, they are really different. For example, the Dwebble here has a fully modeled body inside of the shell. Now, canonically speaking, the body has been shown before, but you don't get a chance to see it here in game. Also inside of Pinsir's body, his legs have a weird shadow texture that connects the leg to the body. Now you might argue that that's a normal effect, kind of like the sunglasses for Team Flare, but essentially no other Pokemon has this feature to them, like Heracross here. He's a perfect example of what you normally see when you look inside of a character model. Then we got Venusaur over here. Venusaur has something that no other Pokemon that I was able to find has, and that is a floating cube inside of the character model. And as we learned from the LEGO Star Wars episode, these cubes are used as handles to be able to move complex objects easily. Now, I imagine that more of these cubes do exist inside other Pokemon, but I also imagine that these cubes are turned invisible so that the player would never get to see them. And thus, Venusaur is a special exception where that cube was not turned invisible. And then we got Torkoal. Now, Torkoal is probably my highlight moment for this episode. I personally love this, so let's break it down. So Torkoal is a Pokemon that has a cloud of steam that shoots out of his back. Now that cloud of steam looks pretty awesome, doesn't it? Well, you'd be surprised to find out that that's not really a 3D object, but when you move the camera, you can see that there is a 3D object behind the 2D object. And that 2D object is projecting the image that's coming off of the 3D object. I, I have to admit, truly bizarre. And with that out of the way, let's give you another zoom out of another beautiful area. And now we gotta talk about cutscenes, because the cutscenes are very special in Pokemon X and Y. For all of you who made it far enough in the game to recognize this scene where there's supposed to be pictures that you see from time to time depicting a story from the past, it might shock you to find out that all these pictures are in a 3D space and they're all in the same map. So when you pan the camera out, you can see all the panels to this story all in one shot. In fact, some of these pictures pan up and down, and so because they do that, you can tell which ones are which because those ones are taller or wider than the others. Some of these pictures even have artifacts outside the boundaries. I found this one in particular to be the strangest, having a weird, almost intentional shape to it on the right here. I almost forgot to mention too, a lot of the trainers don't have a lot going on when you move the camera outside the boundaries, but Lissandra here is the only one that I could find had his Pokeball stored underneath his hand before he in fact throws out his Pokemon. All the other trainers' Pokeballs don't appear until the animation starts. But anyways, back to cutscenes. If you look at the scene where you use the ability fly, you can see that the brown ground over here is a circle, and the blue background over here is a giant square. Also, here's a close-up look of what it looks like when you're riding on a Pokemon for the move Sir. Of course, it's not a surprise to most people that it has a whale-like shape, but you don't usually get up this close, so I thought it'd be very interesting to show you guys. But we keep getting off topic here. So there's this one scene over here where these wires are hooked up and eventually a segment in the cutscene shows the wires severing and then when the cutscene is over you can see that the room now has no wires hooked up. They're disconnected. Well the funny thing about that is that there are two versions of this room and they're both stored in the same map. So if you pan the camera out you can see both versions before and after the cutscene. And then there's this cutscene when the beam goes up into space but you can see that they use the same map as Geo 
Geosenge Town, which is the place where the beam got shot out of. Now, most of the environment for Geosenge got disabled, but you can see other artifacts from the town behind the space textures. And although not a cutscene, I do want to also show you this very unique environment that depicts a cliffside and environments off in the distance, because if we move the camera closer towards that environment, you'll see that there's a town over here that looks like it's on the water. However, if you look at the buildings very closely, you'll see that all five buildings are gyms. It's very interesting that they would choose the gym building as the one building texture. And then of course there's the ending of the game, and there's some really wacky stuff going on here. First of all, a lot of your little friends that you met along the way, those are just 2D textures, or 2D sprites. <laughs> This had to have been a necessity because it was too taxing to have too many high quality models on the screen at once. And then in this scene here, you'll see that Floette is out of bounds in a scene that she's not supposed to be in. Right now, you're just supposed to see the Pokemon trainer and Sycamore talking to each other. But if you look over to the left, you'll see that Floette seems to be there for some reason. And also, did you know that Stuart Zagnick guested on Boundary Break? And if you don't know who that is, that is the original voice of Professor Oak from the anime. Yeah, he did the Pokemon Snap episode of Boundary Break, which since I got your attention right now, I want to show you one little clip from that episode. It's one of my favorite things from it. When a Squirtle goes inside of his shell, you can take the camera inside of the shell and see that his head and limbs are all inside there. Although I don't think it looks quite as comfortable as we all would hope. But anyways, thank you so much for watching. And if you want to see that Pokemon Snap episode, I'll leave a link to it on the screen here as well as in the video description. So I hope you check it out. But anyways, guys, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you very, very soon. Take care.